Hi, welcome to day five of the Easter tree. Today we're going to be studying the call of Abram. Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here we see a big transition. We started off with Noah, who was given a covenantal promise, and that promise was a blessing to all creation. And here we see with Abram, God is beginning to lay a foundation of forming a people for himself. God is initiating this covenant with Abram. When he was living in Ur with his family, so he had his father Terah, and he had his brother and his family. But you see that not everyone in his family had a relationship with God. They adopted the Mesopotamian God and did a lot of moon worshiping. They basically believed in astrology and worshipped the moon. So here God is out of nowhere choosing a man and through this man a people for himself. Not from anything that was special about Abram. It's just God chose him. And Abram, you see him beginning on this 1,500 mile journey by the time he's finished in following God by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. This is amazing, because when they're talking about being as good as dead, he was old. He was a hundred years old when he had a son, and so it was so was Sarah. By physiological standards, it is impossible, and isn't that so God? where he will take an impossible situation that he does a miracle. And that's really his fingerprint of, yep, that was me. At this point, what's probably helpful is to look at a map. I am using the ESV Study Bible, and you can either look at your Study Bible, or you can look at this picture that I painted, where here he starts in Ur, and he's traveling up to Haran, and then from Haran he's coming to this land of Canaan. And that land of Canaan, we know, is modern-day Middle East and where Israel is. And you also see um, Egypt here, too, because Egypt will come into the picture soon. So this is sort of the, the map layout of where Abram's traveling. So in Genesis 12, verse 7, you see that he is now adopted Lot. I also love that. The patriarch of faith history adopted. In verse 7, we see, To your offspring I will give this land. The Lord is basically giving Abram a tour of the property and the land that he is planning on giving him in the future promise. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. We can't take that lightly. Again, what is building an altar? An altar is claiming the land for God and leaving a marker. It's also laying down your will and submitting to God. And it's calling on the name of the Lord. God did not disclose his name to just anybody. In the translation, it's an affectionate covenantal way of calling out to the Lord as Yahweh. It's personal. It's again, the God of the universe coming to us and becoming personal. Isn't that awesome? In this segment, in chapters 12 through 20, you see that Abraham is still a fallen human being. And you see him here, he just basically took his own initiative, taking into account everything except for God. You see this in the Bible with these godly patriarchs, where one minute they are following what God wants them to do, and they are found faithful, and God credits it to them. And then they turn right around and it's like forgetting what you look like and who you are, which we do every day, even with ourselves and in our daily walks with God. 
we forget who we are. We forget God's promise and we begin to just kind of backslide or fall into our normal nature of taking our own initiative, selfish ambition, and vain desires that do not take into account God at all. So we think God has a plan for us, and then we just say, thanks, God, I got it from here, and then we just start to try to work it out ourselves. And we plan, and we don't trust God. <laughs> Maybe you don't have that problem, but I certainly do. Now, in chapter 13 of Genesis, we are now at the part where Lot and Abram are going to separate. So here you see Abram saying, okay, go ahead and choose, Lot. You get first dibs. And Lot of course, makes a decision visually. It's also interesting the juxtaposition of Abram, who, because he rests in the promises of God, and because his security is in God's promises to him, he doesn't feel like he has to fight and fend for himself. And we see that even play out in ourselves every day, don't we? So a question to ask ourselves from reading this is, who is your refuge? Where are your riches? In whom and what do you trust? Do you succumb to temptations easily? These are lots of good things to ponder and to journal. I think that's why journaling is really important because there are times in your life where you are suffering or you are pondering or you are wrestling with decisions and circumstances in your life and with people. And it's good to ponder and to process by journaling it and in some ways, it being your Ebenezer, being your altar, being your, your mark where you are saying, God, what are you doing here? And I'm going to trust you. And by faith, I'm going to give this situation to you. I'm going to give this person to you. I'm going to give my pain to you. And you process it, you mark it so that later on down the line, when you go back, you'll remember, oh, wow, the Lord met me here. And, and I, trust me, you will be praising him and you will be feeling more affection and love with for him because he indeed has revealed himself to you. There are seven promises that God is giving Abraham. And one is, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So then in chapter 14, you see that Lot gets himself in trouble because Lot is making a decision to live right outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then you see him slowly, slowly moving and you find him full out living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in what ways do we sort of put ourselves in temptation's way? Instead of fleeing or not even being in the vicinity, we are attracted to it and we live there. And then, of course, we sabotage ourselves and fall into sin. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. It's important to note here that Melchizedek means king of righteousness, and the king of Salem is also a priest. So we see Melchizedek representing Christ, who is also king and priest. So this is why it's very metaphorical and foreshadowing and just awesome. The Bible is just an incredible, incredible book from even a literature standpoint. Salem was a shortened form of Jerusalem, and it is related to the word peace. So here you see he's a king and priest of peace. Hmm. You see a pattern? You see what the Lord did there? Melchizedek is later spoken of as a type of prefiguration of Jesus or a high priest. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, whose priesthood is in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. So you see that the Old Testament points to the New Testament. The New Testament points back to the Old Testament, and they just wrap it up in a beautiful Tiffany box and bow. It's also important to note here that Melchizedek is bringing out a banquet, bread and wine, as a symbol of a covenant. And we also see that because it's kind of the first communion. What was normal in those days, they would bring out bread and water. But here you see that they're establishing a new tradition of communion between believers in partaking of the bread and the wine. Another foreshadowing. 
Abraham is putting his trust and dependence on God. Abraham is taking the oath very seriously when he swears and when he is blessed by Melchizedek. Now let's open up our Easter egg, the call of Abraham, day five. What is in here today? Ta-da-da-da! Because God said that he would multiply him like the stars. The shiny stars. My challenge to you after having read Genesis chapter 12 through 14 is to take some time to meditate, take some time to ponder, to express yourself as the things that are inside of you are working itself out. So write a poem, write in your journal, sing a song, or draw something. Here I have my contribution. Like I showed you earlier, there's the map and then the image of Melchizedek, the priest and king. So and the bread and the wine. Let me see that. Well, thanks for joining me today, and I hope we can connect again tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye.